was me. She thought she might be raising a crazy kid. The day I'm telling you about was the one when she decided for sure I wasn't crazy after all. Which must have been sort of a relief, and sort of not. You don't talk to anybody about this, she said to me later that day. Except to me, and maybe not even me, kiddo, okay? I said okay. When you're little and it's your mom, you say okay to everything. Unless she says it's bedtime, of course, or to finish your broccoli. We got to our building and the elevator was still broken. You could say things might have been different if it had been working, but I don't think so. I think that people who say life is all about the choices we make and the roads we go down are full of shit. Because, check it, stairs or elevator, we still would have come out on the third floor. When the fickle finger of fate points at you, all roads lead to the same place. That's what I think. I may change my mind when I'm older, but I really don't think so. Fuck this elevator, Mom said. Then, you didn't hear that, kiddo. Hear what? I said, which got me another grin. Last grin for her that afternoon, I can tell you. I asked her if she wanted me to carry her bag, which had a manuscript in it, like always. That day, a big one, looked like a 500-pager. Mom always sat on a bench reading while she waited for me to get out of school, if the weather was nice. She said, sweet offer, but what do I always tell you? You have to tote your own burden in life, I said. Correctamundo. Is it Regis Thomas? I asked. Yes, indeed. Good old Regis who pays our rent. Is it about Roanoke? Do you even have to ask, Jamie? Which made me snicker. Everything good old Regis wrote was about Roanoke. That was the burden he toted in life. We went up the stairs to the third floor, where there were two other apartments plus ours at the end of the hall. Ours was the fanciest one. Mr. and Mrs. Burkett were standing outside 3A, and I knew right away something was wrong because Mr. Burkett was smoking a cigarette, which I hadn't seen him do before and was illegal in our building anyway. His eyes were bloodshot, and his hair was all crazied up in gray spikes. I always called him Mr., but he was actually Professor Burkett and taught something smart at NYU. English and European literature, I later found out. Mrs. Burkett was dressed in a nightgown, and her feet were bare. That nightgown was pretty thin, and I could see most of her stuff right through it. My mother said, Marty, what's wrong? Before he could say anything back, I showed him my turkey, because he looked sad and I wanted to cheer him up, but also because I was so proud of it. Look, Mr. Burkett, I made a turkey. Look, Mrs. Burkett. I held it up for her in front of my face because I didn't want her to think I was looking at her stuff. Mr. Burkett paid no attention. I don't think he even heard me. Tia, I have some awful news. Mona died this morning. My mother dropped her bag with the manuscript inside it between her feet and put her hand over her mouth. Oh no, tell me that's not true. He began to cry. She got up in the night and said she wanted a drink of water. I went back to sleep and she was on the couch this morning with a comforter pulled up to her chin. And so I tiptoed to the kitchen and put on the coffee because I thought the pleasant smell would wake. Would wake. He really broke down then. Mom took him in her arms the way she did me when I hurt myself, even though Mr. Burkett was about a hundred. Seventy-four, I found out later. That was when Mrs. Burkett spoke to me. She was hard to hear, but not as hard as some of them because she was still pretty fresh. She said, turkeys aren't green, James. Well, mine is, I said. My mother was still holding Mr. Burkett and kind of rocking him. They didn't hear her because they couldn't, and they didn't hear me because they were doing adult things, comforting for mom, blubbering for Mr. Burkett. Mr. Burkett said, I called Dr. Allen, and he came and said she probably had a soak. At least that's what I thought, he said. He was crying so much it was hard to tell. He called the funeral parlor. They took her away. I don't know what I'll do without her. Mrs. Burkett said, My husband is going to burn your mother's hair with his cigarette if he doesn't look out. And sure enough, he did. I could smell the singeing hair, a kind of beauty shop smell. Mom was too polite to say anything about it, but she made him let go of her, and then she took the cigarette from him and dropped it on the floor and stepped on it. I thought that was a grody thing to do, extreme litter bugging, but I didn't say anything.